Good afternoon. I am Jesse Weiler with the Institute on Religious Life here with Father Bob Lombardo. Father, how are you doing today? Very good, Jesse. It's good to be with you, and it's great to be with all those that are supportive of religious life and the Institute. I totally agree. And Father, you are on the board for the Institute on Religious Life. You are a Franciscan friar of the renewal, and you are also the uh, Superior General for the Franciscans of the Eucharist in Chicago, Illinois. That's a lot of hats that you have. Yep, say that three times <laughs> fast. Yeah, so I like to keep myself busy. I'd rather be busy than well, bored. That, I, I completely agree. Totally agree. Well, before we uh, get into this uh, Franciscan spirituality and times of uncertainty, would you mind leading us off in prayer? Sure. Let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most high, glorious God, enlighten the darkness of our hearts. Instill in us a correct faith a certain hope and a perfect love, a sense and a knowledge, Lord, that we may do your holy and true command. Amen. Our Lady of the Angels, pray for us. St. Francis and all saints, pray for, us. pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That prayer was one that St. Francis wrote. It's called the prayer before the crucifix. And I think that it speaks well to discernment and to doing God's will. Well, he was certainly a great mind, and he had a great love of God and a great love of the Paschal mystery. And uh, what I want to talk to you about today and pick your brain as, as a Franciscan, um, we, are, we are in times of uncertainty right now. There's a lot of unrest politically. There's a lot of unrest medically with the pandemic, and who knows what's going to be happening but it seems this like this calendar year has been really tumultuous and people are having a really hard time coming to terms with how to deal with it uh, mentally, spiritually, certainly being without the sacraments for so long, I think has been very difficult for people. Um, so what can St. Francis teach us about being in a time of unrest like this? Well, our Franciscan spirituality is very Christocentric, centered on the person of Christ. And that's the way St. Francis grounded his life. He too lived in an era of great societal upheaval. There were city-state wars, there was illness, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not that this is the first time that we have encountered this in the history of the world. But what St. Francis teaches us is to stay focused on the person of Jesus and live out the gospel that he left us. And people found that very attractive. And I think that when your life is grounded in the person of Jesus Christ, you live in a different way. Our Lord said over and over again in the gospels, be not afraid, be not afraid. And one of the themes that I hear very frequently is people are afraid. They're afraid of the sickness. They're afraid of the societal upheaval, etc. And so I think it's a, it could be for us a reminder or a renewed call to focus back on the person of Jesus Christ. And though we're basically just now reopening in a very limited way our churches, especially here in the Chicago Archdiocese, but we can still encounter our Lord in the scriptures. And everyone can take that time to be with the Lord in that special way. I would love to know about anything that St. Francis said about redemptive suffering, being able to unite ourselves in pain and sorrow and suffering with Christ on the cross. It's very clear that he had a devotion to the crucifix, having been you know, spoken to by Christ on the cross. That is a powerful thing. What, what does St. Francis say about that redemptive suffering? Well, for St. Francis, as we know, even from the artwork that we see, there's a beautiful depiction of St. Francis reaching out to embrace Jesus on the cross. So embracing suffering would be the lesson that we learn. And we learn a lot from St. Francis by the way that he lived his life and by the way that he would embrace the poorest of the poor which were the lepers of his own day and age, and how he experienced Christ in that suffering. When he had the encounter with the leper outside of the city of Assisi, right near what is presently Rivotorto, 
in the Umbrian Valley, a very, very beautiful area of central Italy. And we know from that experience that when St. Francis looked at that leper and reached out to help that leper, he experienced Jesus in a very, very powerful way. So what we can learn is that in this suffering, we can encounter our Lord. And I think that's one of the best takeaways that we can have from St. Francis. What about this idea that uh, he would retreat and have these moments of silence, these moments of simple clarity? Because even in a time where we've reduced our social interaction, I believe that a lot of us have ramped up our social, uh, you know, um, online interaction. And so when we have a void, we tend to fill that with other things. What, what can we learn from St. Francis about retreating a little and really embracing the silence and distance? Because he often would go out um, into nature and just spend time praying by himself. Yeah, well, you know, as Franciscans, we look at the life of our founder probably in a unique way in that we look to his person and example. And we say that he spent about a third of his time in prayer, a third with the community, and then a third preaching and or taking care of people in need. So right there we see a balance. And when St. Francis went off to pray, he would like to be alone, and he became a friend of silence. And I think that this challenging time that we find ourselves in is pricking the conscience of each and every one of us, because we have become so accustomed to noise. We wake up in the morning to an alarm clock that probably plays music. We have waterproof radios and different types of equipment where we can listen to music even in the shower. As soon as we turn on the car, there's either the traffic report or music. And I think that it's a a challenge and a call to us to become friends of silence. And St. Francis certainly was a friend of silence. And it's in that quiet that we hear the promptings of our Lord. So I think that that's something very beautiful that we could learn. And it's, and it's challenging. Becoming a friend of silence, it's like growing in any other type of friendship. There are fits and starts. But I think that it's a call to us to revisit the beautiful silence. Here in our little Franciscan community on the west side, we're dedicated to our Lord in the Eucharist. That's why the title Franciscans of the Eucharist to see Christ in the Eucharist and then to see Christ in the poor. And I I would challenge us as Catholics that we have to be able to see Christ in the Eucharist to be able to see him in the poor. And what we started doing since the pandemic started is we have each taken an extra hour of quiet, silent adoration time in our chapel. So the Blessed Sacrament is exposed uh, all throughout the day, and we each go in and take turns. Again, growing in that appreciation for that silent encounter with the Lord. And it's not that we didn't do it previously, but what I'm saying is we've added an extra hour of that quiet time. So there's always an opportunity in every challenge. Absolutely. I, I Thank you so much for that. I think that is very true, and I think... Uh, with I didn't even think about how much uh, detail goes into flooding our lives with technology and, and outside noise. It goes even beyond what I was thinking initially. Uh, one of the other things that I'm thinking a lot about is this. When we reduce the, the amount of masses that were available and the amount of sacraments that were available, we started to have at-home masses on TV. A lot of people did that. Sometimes they would read scripture on their own, but they'd be watching the mass. I have a feeling that a lot of people are going to say, well, you know, I went three months without going to Mass. I don't think I really need to go anymore. I can just watch it on TV, and it's super convenient. And they might lapse a little in their sacramental life. Now, Francis was tasked with rebuilding the church, and I think we're going to have a lot of rebuilding to do after this. Can you speak a little bit about how we can use Francis's inspiration to really work hard at bringing people back in 
once we start rolling again? Well, I think there are a couple of things that jump out at me as you ask that question, uh, Jesse. And the first is, yes, we have the beautiful experience with the cross of San Damiano, where St. Francis was praying and the lips on the crucifix moved and St. Francis heard the words, rebuild my church, for as you see, it's falling into ruin. That's something that needed to be done prior to the pandemic as well. So let's not lose sight of the fact that we were in a very challenging position as a church prior to the pandemic. And many people had a looser connection to the church. And some of that connection to the church was waning. Now, with that said, I think that coming out of this, we have an opportunity because from what I hear, at least in my limited encounters with people, they're clamoring to get back with other people. People are very much uh, fatigued with being at home and being away from other people. So I think if we could use that as a springboard to say, well, here's an opportunity to come together with other people that are like-minded, that want to praise Almighty God, that want to come together to support and encourage one another in their life of prayer. If you have a minute, I'll tell you a brief little anecdote. Um, sure. Because a week ago, yeah, a week ago, uh, one of our African American neighbors who has been working with a farmer's market here on the West Side began once again this yearly, every summer, the farmer's market. And she called and she said, you know, Father, would you come on over? I want to begin the farmer's market with a little prayer service. And she said to me that because of all of the turmoil that we're going through right now, she's realizing how important it is that we pray and also that we pray in the public square. And she said, every time we open up the farmer's market, I want someone here leading a prayer. So I think that there's also that hunger that we're experiencing. St. Augustine said it very, very well. And St. Augustine was a great teacher of St. Francis. St. Augustine hit the nail on the head. Our hearts are restless until they rest in the O Lord. And so I think if we can help to express and to verbalize that restlessness of heart, we could help our people to make their way back to the sacraments and to communion in the church once again. Now, you guys in your charism are uniquely inserted into the neighborhood that you live in, in a way that a lot of other religious communities aren't. And you have a pulse on what's happening, specifically in the African-American community, but in, in a poorer community as well. What What is going on both with the pandemic and kind of the political unrest that's happening? Um, how, how are you guys utilizing the, those encounters to be able to bring Christ into the conversation? Okay. Well, first off, our work has expanded in terms of outreach to the poor. The preaching dimension is somewhat limited, even though the sisters are still doing their classwork online, they're doing the, the um, electronic teaching and, and that sort of a thing. But here in the neighborhood, we're helping out right now between 650 and 900 families every week with a shopping cart full of food. And they come to us or we have to deliver their food if they're in the vulnerable population. So we're in very frequent contact with our neighbors and we're out there on the street. So we're actually in contact with people that don't even need food. So. I think that we do have a pulse on what's going on in our neighborhood. And I would say this, first, people are very concerned about their health. In the African-American community, as in the Hispanic community, the COVID rates are much higher than in other areas. There are probably a variety of factors, which you know I'm not well-versed to speak to those. I'm not a medical person. So what we see is, 
a very strong emphasis on wearing masks. When we have asked people to keep their social distance while they're in line for food, the lines for food go several blocks right now because they're keeping six feet or more of distance. So people are very aware of the health issues and wanting to make sure that people are in, in good shape. People are also very concerned about treating everyone justly. And they are very, very upfront in speaking about how in the African-American community, people have been treated unfairly based on a prejudice of looking at the color of someone's skin. However, however, they are absolutely positively furious at the rioting and the looting. In our neighborhood here on the west side of Chicago, when the looting happened that weekend here in Chicago, first of all, we were right in the middle of it and I thought, uh-oh, we're gonna be in bad shape. But thank God our neighbors really put the word out, don't come anywhere near our buildings and thank God any one of us as well. But everything here was decimated to the point where the only place where people could buy food was the shady gas station one block away from our church. The food stores were looted, pharmacies were looted, the little clinics that had pharmacies within them looted and vandalized. Everything from shoe stores to banks. People were actually crying the first days of the week after the riots because they couldn't get prescriptions filled. All the pharmacies were hit within a five mile radius of us. So it was horrific. So they're also very angry because they remember what happened, especially the old timers, when they have the memory of what happened in the 60s with the riots. And they said, you know, our neighborhoods never recovered from that. And now it's going to take us another generation or two to recover from this. So there's also anger at the way that the justice and racial issues have sadly deteriorated from peaceful expressions to violent uh, expressions. So I think it's important that people hear that because we're living right here and, and our people are very honest and they're like, I can't even go to the store and get food right now. And, uh, or they have to go traipse, you know, taking two or three buses to get to another neighborhood. So uh, what is the next step? Where do you go from there? Where do you go from that place of sorrow and uncertainty and sometimes hatred and anger? How, to, how do you, as a religious you know, community embedded in this neighborhood, help to you know, infuse them with hope and joy in a period where it's so dark? You know, actually, God has infused them with hope and joy because our people are resilient. They've lived a rough life their whole life. So they know what it's like to get the short end of the stick. And it's very fascinating to listen to them. They're extremely grateful for all that we're able to do during this. And they express it. And they're very grateful to God. We pray with them on the street. We're very open about talking about our faith. And so are they. Very open. And they say, you know, God's going to take care of us. You know, and they they have a, an understanding of of divine providence that is um, it's very edifying. So it's not so much of what we can bring. It's a matter of just looking and seeing what the Lord is already doing in their lives. And, and these are people of faith. I want to shift gears just a little bit and talk uh, about the religious order that you're the superior general of. So obviously you're. Franciscan Fire Renewal, but you're tasked with supporting and encouraging and helping to grow the Franciscans of the Eucharist. Um, there's a lot of different Franciscan orders out there, but what is the charism of the Franciscans of the Eucharist, and what would you tell somebody who's actually looking into the religious life? What, what does your community have to offer that might interest them? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for asking, Jesse. And, uh, you know, I always say that I have dual citizenship in a way, you know, because uh, I'm a founding member of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, obviously. 
and uh, and then also responsible for the Franciscans of the Eucharist of Chicago. And, you know, one of the things about our CFR community is we've always tried to help to build up religious life. So we don't look at it as only our community, the CFRs, but how could we help other religious as well? So I see this as an opportunity to help. Now, here with the Franciscans of the Eucharist of Chicago, they wanted to live a life that was similar to, but not equal to the CFR charism. So they wanted to be able to live and work with the poor. They wanted to live um, a way of poverty that was more on the spectrum of the austere. Uh, And they also, and this is where the shade of difference comes in from the CFRs, is that they wanted to have perpetual adoration and they wanted the ability to get back into our Catholic schools to teach religion. They saw that there was a need for the religious to be back in the schools. Um, and we don't teach. So we have, I have to make sure that the CFR charism stays clear and crisp and fresh. So the lifestyle would be very similar and would also include the opportunity for perpetual adoration as well as the opportunity to get back into our Catholic schools and teach. Now, we've also spoken about, well, what happens if, our, and that would be in poor neighborhoods. So we would concentrate in poor, underserved Catholic schools. And we've also talked about, well, then what do you do if our, we lose those Catholic schools due to financial constraints or whatever? Um, so they're also prepared to be CREs or DREs, directors of religious education or coordinators of religious education in the parishes. And those are also two positions that we would not assume as CFRs. So so that would be the the shade of difference. So there may be people out there that are interested in a Franciscan charism of living and working uh, in a poor neighborhood. All of us take care of the poor. We all do itinerant preaching, going out, doing retreat work, parish missions, school visits, and then also the opportunity for perpetual adoration and getting back into the classrooms. So hopefully that helps a little bit just to give a, like a thumbnail sketch. Now, obviously, the the beginning of this religious order was uh, in due large part by Cardinal Francis George. What, what was he envisioning? Why did he say, why did he think we needed this in the city of Chicago? What was it that he was in so pushing towards uh, to really infuse that particular community into the city of Chicago? Well, first of all, you know, he asked our community, the CFRs, to come out here to Chicago, and we had made a decision as a community to go to places where there is more of a shortage of priests and religious. And so Chicago didn't fit the bill. Uh, The cardinal... Uh, I got to know him by coming out to visit since he made the request of us. I was sent out to sort of reconnoiter or look at what would be offered out here. And that's how I got to meet him. So when the decision was made by our community that we just didn't have the personnel and that we would look toward areas where there would be a more of a shortage of clergy than in this area, uh, the cardinal asked me if I would be willing to come out to get something started because he was concerned that as schools and parishes were closing, they were closing in poor neighborhoods and he didn't want it to appear that the church was abandoning the poor. So that was my mission, so to speak, when I came out here. That was what I was tasked to do, is to establish a Catholic outreach to take care of the spiritual as well as the material needs of the poor in this area. He wanted it at Our Lady of the Angels because this is the site of the tragic school fire where on December 1st of 1958, 92 students and three BVM religious sisters were killed and hundreds of students were injured that afternoon in that tragic fire. 
And then from that, young people were coming to volunteer and they were talking to me about discerning. And so I said, well, you know, I'll meet with them on a Friday night. And I did that for a bit of time and I sent them out. They were interested in teaching. They're interested in this, that, the other thing. So I said, well, there's a list of communities. Knock your socks off, go and visit. And they kept on coming back. And then it was, well, what about doing something here? And, uh, you know, again, I hemmed and hawed as I usually do because, uh, you know, I, I don't want to ever overstep my bounds, but when it becomes evident that God wants something, I've learned get out of the way. So I brought that to the Cardinal and I said, look, I have a group of young people. This is what they're interested in. It doesn't fit in with the CFR charism. We don't teach and we don't have perpetual adoration. And they also want to live and work with the poor. It's not that there aren't other communities that have adoration, but they wanted to base themselves in a poor, physically, materially poor neighborhood. Um, so there really weren't a lot of options out there. And then the Cardinal said, well, you know, I would like this to happen. I think it would be very important. And we need to get sisters back in the Catholic schools. Um, a lot of our teaching orders have faced some headwinds since the Second Vatican Council, and that's not a secret to anybody listening to this. And so the presence of religious in our schools has greatly diminished over time. So to have young people that wanted to do that, uh, the Cardinal, um, in his goodness, established the, the community. So it's a long answer, but I want to I want to make sure that it's it's clear with uh, with what's out there. Absolutely. And thank you very much for kind of adding distinguishing the two because I think that's kind of hard to have your your foot in one area and the other at the same time but um at a certain point like you said if God wants it and the spirit is willing, you know, to provide then then it will happen. If uh if somebody wants to get involved with the Franciscans of the Eucharist, if they want to come out for a retreat or a short mission trip, or they're interested in the religious order, where can they go? Well, we have a web page, which we're actually redoing. Uh, we're updating it uh, this summer, so we're actually working on it this week. But it is Franciscans of the Eucharist of Chicago.com, and they can also check out our web page for the mission of Our Lady of the Angels, which is Mission. O-L-A, for Our Lady of the Angels, missionola.com, or with the phone ringing to my left side over here, which you may have just heard, they could also call us at 773-486-8431. Right now, because of the COVID pandemic, we're very limited in our capacity to receive volunteers, but we're hoping that things will open up in the future. And we are still going full steam ahead with our construction project of renovating the former school here at Our Lady of the Angels, which will be able to house up to 45 retreatants and volunteers, only over 18. We get a lot of requests from high school groups that want to do service trips. We are not allowed to provide housing, but when that facility is finished, hopefully in the late fall, and by then, we're hoping that the restrictions of the corona pandemic will have loosened to the point where we'll be able to once again receive people. But many of the groups here in the Chicago area come for day trips to do some volunteer work. We always incorporate that in with adoration and prayer time. The sisters give talks to uh, especially the teenagers and things of that nature. So we're happy to accommodate that. If anyone thinks that they may have a vocation, that's phenomenal give us a call and we'd be happy to to discuss those possibilities with them okay father that uh ends our time here would you mind closing us with a prayer and a blessing sure in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen let us give glory to the father the son and holy spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever amen the lord be and with, with your you spirit. may almighty god bless you the father the son and the holy spirit 
Amen. Go forth in peace. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Father, so much. And thank you for your help with the Institute on Religious Life. I hope we get to have another conversation shortly. Great. My pleasure. Thank you very much for all you're doing to help us, Jesse. Bye-bye.